I guess that leads to the, the sort of next subject of confidentiality. That's a tough one today. Um, you know, we're, we're in this environment where there's massive exposure of everything and uncovering of everything. And this concept of confidentiality is challenging. We're all good at gossip, you know, but we're also good at, um, and people are good. People want to display their own personal issues yeah. publicly, mm -hmm. unlike ever before. Mm -hmm. I often will scroll through social media and think, why are you telling this to the world? Yeah. Very personal, private, embarrassing well, things. Well, I saw, I saw this pastor recently, since you say that. You know, there was this very narcissistic fellow chiding his pastor, saying, why don't you give me time? Why are, why are you not this? And it was narcissistic. And then the pastor comes on and, and shares his rebuke with everyone on Facebook of the guy. You know, it's like, and the, the, pastor's, both your houses. Yeah, the pot, the pastor's justification was I'm trying to help men, you know, people to man up and be whatever it was. And I'm like, that's not how we shepherd sheep. No. You know, we're not, we're not exposing all of them. We're in the ministry because they're narcissistic. So the sheep acts like a goof, so I have to respond like a goof? Well, that's what I'm saying. The same narcissism was exactly. expressed on the opposite end. No like, wonder. Look at, look at me. I was bold in rebuking the sheep. <laughs> Come on. Like, that's not how we shepherd. Unbelievable. Right? And love covers a multitude of sins. We should not want to have out there the sins of the sheep that would hurt and our very shepherding of them. Right. Right? So that's the goal the goal is to to love the sheep and and, she, uh, and shepherd them. And so, you know, confidentiality is important. What's difficult about confidentiality is when lies are being spread that are contrary to what you know to be true. And I maybe engage this. I had a counselor once say to me, when lies are being told, you always have to correct lies with the truth. How does that fit into confidentiality on issues that we are, you know, because at times the elders are are taking it on the head, right? Things are being said out there, and we know the truth of the matter. And what do we do about that, right? Yeah, I don't think I agree with that. You yeah. always have to correct lies with the truth. I think it takes it obviously it takes in that wisdom. context, right. right? Yeah, it takes wisdom. Obviously, maybe sometimes you have to yeah. correct lies with the truth. Maybe sometimes you have to. Put down the lie. If someone says X is happening and you can say, well, no, X is not happening. Maybe. You don't have to tell them that Y actually is happening, mm -hmm. but you can say, all right, no, that's not actually happening. Right. But sometimes you can't even say that. I know. I know. That's, that's where it gets hard. Yeah. When there are things happening that the, they don't know the details. They don't know all the fine details of the situation. And you do. He said, I can't reveal it. Right. I can't because it would it would be harmful to to the very shepherding that we're trying to draw out. It may be in repentance of somebody. Right. You know? Yeah. It's very difficult to maintain that confidentiality when it's necessary. Right. Right. Do you need to get that? Someone's calling My you to rebuke ringing, you. My phone's ringing, but we're not even going to stop the recording. Someone, Somebody's trying to get a hold of me and, you know, we're, trying to rebuke. we're in a confidential <laughs> recording. So <laughs> Why don't you take the call? No, I'm not going to take, take the call. I don't want to stop the recording. I have to edit all this. So just know, uh, pastor, the pastor's the getting phone. a call and whoever it is, I'll call you back. The pastoral bat phone. <laughs> it's Commissioner Gordon. I thought that was your cell. <laughs> <laughs> not mine. <laughs> so, um, but why do we have confidentiality? You know, clearly in any sort of counseling arrangement, confidentiality ag agreements are signed to protect people. Is that how the church functions? Well, we don't function as a... <laughs> our congregation does not require people to sign an NDA when they become <laughs> church members. Although, <laughs> there have been some very high-profile evangelical churches in recent years yeah. who've had their former staff sign NDAs Otherwise, they won't get their severance package. I think Mars Hill did that as part of the that we that was yeah. uncovered as part of the Mars Hill mm -hmm. podcast series by Christianity Today. So, if a church asks you to sign an NDA, that's a massive red flag. <laughs> it's a massive red flag. <laughs> I always remind people the church's business is public. 
Yeah. We do not. This is important, especially in the abuse culture. There's a challenge here of covering up things that we are required to report. Right. And and I want to make sure we touch on that, that we have obligations when it is a violation of civil law. Yeah. We're not covering these things up. And that has gone on to the church's hurt a lot. Yeah. That can be really challenging, especially when you're trying to draw out repentance from one, say somebody's repentant. But that doesn't mean that somebody is then, just because they're repentant, that they now they now have, have um, lost all, you know, consequences of their actions civilly, right? Repentance does not mean immunity. That's right. So, yeah, if someone comes to us and discloses a crime... Right. And is repentant, we could say, yeah, God forgives you. I've reported numerous times. Uh, we have to report. Yeah. People might not know, as pastors, we are mandatory reporters. We are mandatory reporters. In the state of California. Right. That we have to report these things. So that's not just a choice for us. We have to do it. Right. So some things cannot be confidential. And those things that are being reported are right to be reported. Yeah. I mean, if you're threatening your life, if you've done harm to somebody, those things that are required, there's a reason we have the law. Right. So so it's not saying, you know, confidentiality is is not qualified in this regard. And if someone says, well, what about that person? Now you're bringing the law into this. Yeah, and it might not go that well right. legally right. for the person who has disclosed something to us. And the authorities, the legal authorities, may botch the case, as we've seen countless times. Yeah. We can't right. necessarily blindly trust government officials to conduct things appropriately in every case. But... Those are the risks we have to take in order to protect the body of Christ. Right. Because if there's any appearance of a cover-up, yeah. it could take down the entire church. Yeah. I mean, that's just, it's amazing what has been covered up when the responsibility was because civil law was broken to the harm of neighbor, that there are consequences to actions. And that's just life. Yeah. You may be eternally forgiven. But you may have to suffer real consequences, and that's that's where our responsibility to that to that respecting and honoring of the civil magistrate requires us to report. Yeah. So, um, in terms of confidentiality with our wives as office bearers, um, our wives, especially pastors' wives, they carry an incredible weight on them that I don't think people understand. Um, th- you're always in the fishbowl. You're always being watched. Um, I've seen many guys who I thought could be good pastors, but their wives make them unqualified. Yeah. I've just seen yeah. it. And and that's not something we talk a lot about just because they, they're not going to be able to handle this. Right. They are not. I, and I've seen it happen yep. numerous times in the ministry. That said, um, our wives also need to be protected. Absolutely. Our wives also need to be shepherded and sh- and kept from certain things that can harm her ability to function in the flock in a healthy way. Right. I tell other, other pastors, future pastors, our elders, our deacons, your wives should know nothing more than what an average church member knows about what's happening in the church. Yeah. People should not come to your wife looking for dirt. Yeah. Right. Your wife it should be known in the congregation that your wife knows nothing more mm-hmm. than any other church member. So they won't even come asking her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only to protect confidentiality, obviously that side of the situation, but to protect your wife. Mm-hmm. If you love your wife, you will not unload the problems of the church on her. No. That no. is cruel. No. It's not loving. There is a sense where I think, you know, if you have a very mature wife, you can lean on her for wisdom questions without the specifics. Like yeah. I, I, I talk to my wife. I, I think my wife has been incredibly helpful to me uh, in keeping me in check. <laughs> but also, um, you know, in times where I just I need to talk to my wife about certain principles, certain things, and she comes in, and I'm amazed at the wisdom God has given her. So 
that's been a blessing. But you're absolutely right. The last thing we want to do is go into the specific hardships, sins, conflicts in the life of the congregation that would make her be unable to function well and how she, as a pastor's wife, bears the burden and responsibility and in that very calling in place to um, to love them. We're called to this. Yeah. We're called to this office. Our wives are not. Right. There is no office of pastor's There's no wife. office. We are called to bear this burden. God has placed this on us, and he's equipped us to do it. He has not equipped them to no. do it because they are not called to this office. It's not because they're inferior in some way. Don't think of any patriarchal sort of males are vastly superior to women in every way. It's not about that. It's about calling. It's about calling. It is about calling. I I guess I would say, I'm not disagreeing with you. I guess I would say that, however, if there's a pastor's wife, she should be the kind of thing that's mentioned of a deacon's wife, right? She should have those kind of qualities and wisdom to be able to encourage her husband in the difficulties, the past in the difficulties without doing what you're saying. Her job is to serve, is to, is to minister to her husband. Mm -hmm. She should care for you. Right. And yeah, you come home after a contentious meeting, you know, and you could say tough meeting and she can care for you, but you don't have to unload on her and give her all the gruesome details of, of why you look beleaguered. Exactly. She's going to see it on your face. Obviously we're not saying like, don't talk to me. (laughs) We're not, don't be a, a, an ogre about it. Just don't be, just don't come home and vomit Mm -hmm. all your troubles to your wife about what happened in a church meeting. Yeah, I I think we overlook, though, the burdens that pastor's wives carry because we do carry so much. And like, I, you know, this is one of the dangers, you know, I don't know how often it's done or how well pastors do it. Or if it should be done, that once you walk in the door, you leave everything outside. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty hard to do that. You know, you carry these things. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about these things, but um, depending on the nature of the this, this situation. And she she has to sometimes put up with an absent-minded yeah. husband because of this. Not just sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the challenges of of uh, a pastor who's dealing with a lot of spiritual conflict in his, in his life and, and in the life of the congregation She's got to be incredibly patient and understanding yeah. to be in this. I mean, so I guess what I'm saying is, is that I think it's overlooked how much the pastor's wife actually does go go through. So we don't want to add burden exactly. upon burden. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm it's saying. hard enough. It's hard enough. If you do keep your mouth shut when yeah. necessary, yeah. if you come home and unload all that onto your wife, she can't, yeah. she can't bear that. Right. And I've seen multiple pastor's wives have actual mental breakdowns. I too. Because their husbands have unloaded on them. That's it is tragic. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So this is this is important. And I think it's an encouragement to parishioners who listen to this to pray for your pastor's wife. Um, she's she's very important to, to the help me and being a help me to her husband in this very calling. Yeah. So and not only we need to protect our wives from what we can do to them and unloading too much onto them. We must protect our wives from unhealthy expectations from the congregation. Mm-hmm. Amen to this. Amen to this. This is good. There has to be, and, and your children as well, there has to be a clear expectation of your wife in the life of the church. And if she is not the hostess with the mostess yeah. and worthy of being the successor to Martha Stewart as far as a uh, a woman uh, in, in, in uh, hospitality and so forth, you have to protect her from those things. Yeah, right. And I always tell our congregation, the same expectations of every church member are belong to my wife. She has no more expectations than what any other church member would do Yeah, as far as serving in the church. Again, there's no office of pastor's wife. Mm-hmm. And if people have higher expectations than that, We have to shield her from those illegitimate expectations. I've seen two kinds of pastor's wives without getting into trouble here. (laughs) But um, especially if a man's ministry is not going well, pastor's wife can overcompensate to try to fill that void and fix that problem by having her hands in everything. Um, That's one danger 
or just naturally she's way too involved in everything um, just because of her personality, that kind of personality, and does everything so that the expectation of the pastor's wife is developed in that congregation yeah. as a very office itself because she's doing all of this, playing the organ, playing the piano, doing all these things, involved, 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 which is okay to some extent. That's not... But there can be a sort of controlling pastor's wife that gets over-involved as opposed to a pastor's wife, which I think is more, you know, something that is more healthy. I'm not saying that being involved is bad. That that's She has gifts, too, that sure. she needs to use in the life of the church and utilize those gifts. That's important. It's very important. Yes. But I do think probably a more healthy scenario is that the pastor's wife is more hands-off in some ways and not having her hand in every piece of the pie in the life of the church. Um, because that can create a lot of difficulty, expectation, and conflict itself. She already has enough eyes on her. Yep. And my experience has been is that there's an over-expectation on pastor's wives to do all these things because they're a pastor's wife. And I don't, I'm not so sure that's healthy. Right. I'm not so, so sure that's that's wise or right. Um, I'm not saying there's a, a rule on this, but I am saying that uh, a pastor's wife who is more behind the scenes and not having her hand in every bit of it, I, because I've seen that opposite extreme, is a more healthy scenario than the opposite. Yeah. And one of the real dangers comes is if your wife is involved in everything, inevitably there's going to come criticism. Yeah. And how are you going to respond to that criticism? Then it becomes personal. Especially when, as I said before, if the if the pastor's wife's overly involved in everything, she's going to hear a lot more criticism of her husband if it's not going yep. well. So there is a healthy, this is tough with ministry. There's a healthy distance. Yeah. While we get close to the flock, we love the flock, we're in the lives of the flock, there's also a healthy distance that's necessary. Uh, yes. I remember a wise old pastor told me this, healthy distance, just remember that, healthy distance. When you're too close, it's like the youth pastor, <laughs> so, <laughs> buddies with everyone, you know? Um, it's kind of the familiarity breeds contempt thing. Right. It's a, tr it's a thing. Yes. It's a real thing. Right. Like you, you need to have a healthy distance that you're not so close that you're just one of the pals. Right. Right. But and there's great disagreement on this. There's a great disagreement. Say, some pastors are more tight, friendly mm -hmm. with their Personality members of their church. Matters, right? right. And some people will have close friends right. in the congregation. I'm of another view that we can be friendly, of right. course. Right. But I don't have close friends in my congregation purposefully because I don't want to be become a pal. And again, why? Because I don't want to risk my usefulness as a minister because I need a friend. Right. Um, when you have a, a, a close friend, you have somebody you can let down with. Yeah. Someone you can sort of be yourself with, right? That can, when it's a leader, a fellow leader, that can actually cause some problems. Yes. So I guess what we're saying here is anyone hears us, this is a wisdom issue. Yeah. Without a healthy distance, right? Without being too close, without being too far away. Um, and, and in the way that we're close is a way of shepherding care that shows deep interest in the life of the sheep. So we are as close as possible, but in the way that we are walking among them, that, that healthy distance promotes something that I'm trying to find my words as I go here on this one, because it is sticky. Very. Right. It's a healthy distance that promotes the kind of thing that doesn't end up worshiping the pastor. Yeah. Um, in other words, it, it you can actually get so close that the people end up dependent upon you in a bad way, right? I've seen this, and it's not healthy. Or the flip side. They get so close, they see some of your faults mm -hmm. that are not necessary for them to see. There it is. That's see now that's really good. And that's again, why absolutely is that, true. Why is that a problem? 
Not because, oh no, what will they think of me now? Right. Who cares? It's not about you. It's about how can I receive the word from this guy when I know this about him? Yeah. All pastors are sinners, but this sort of incarnational ministry thing is yeah. what you're talking about, you know, and it's, it's just silliness. Yeah. It's, it's kind of weird so that, so that, you know, we want to be real. Of course we got to be real. We, we've got to be able to speak of our sins. We've got to be able to confess our sins to people. There's no doubt. But there is something that, that the normal relationship, a pastor has a different kind of relationship with the flock than the flock has with itself. Yes. That's what we're trying to say. Right. Right. And that's good. And, and same thing with your elders. Now, you might be closer with your elders than you are with non-officer church members. But I always tell guys, the elders are not your friends. Right. They're not pals. Again, you can be friendly, but you still have to have a professional relationship. Again, you don't have to be completely closed off and right. don't ask me anything about my life whatsoever. No, obviously, you don't be weird. Right. But you cannot let your hair down around members of your congregation, including your elders and deacons. Yeah. That's for a separate venue. I've just seen so many guys in the evangelical world do this, and they lose any sort of authoritative respect from yeah. the pulpit. You know what I'm saying? It's embarrassing. It's like they're they're just they're so one of the guys. I don't think too many people take them serious when they're preaching. Right, and their preaching never comes with any authority. Right, and because why are they doing so it? Tried They've so tried to enter this incarnational approach. This is such a silly thing. Sorry. <laughs> Have you heard that? Oh, language? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, we, I know you used to use it, but yeah. you should stop. <laughs> I repented uh, of it. We had one incarnation. We don't need another. We're that's all set. That's exactly right. It's exactly right. So anyways. But, uh, and, and it's narcissistic and it's like therapeutic. Yeah. Like, oh, I just want to confess with you and be real with you. It's it's yeah. their therapy. It's like public Therapy. Yeah, there's something it's very strange. There's something about the people wanting the pastor to be like that, that is pandering to them. Yeah. In a weird way that actually is a form. Here's another aspect of this. It's actually a form of controlling the pastor mm. so that they don't, they don't have to ever feel that he's bringing authoritatively the word of God that's calling them to repent. Yeah. There's something to that. You can't like, call me to repent when I know what you need to yeah, repent. Yeah, and so that it's a, it's a way of bringing down the pastor off the pulpit. Yeah, and because in their lives they don't really want to be confronted of some things, and they can feel better about themselves when the pastor doesn't do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> dangerous. Right? Yeah, it's dangerous. So there's these are these are things we all have to wrestle through. It takes a lot of wisdom from the Holy Spirit to and um, and just as a general rule of thumb. It's easier to stay silent and be cautious in what you say. You can always disclose more. Yeah. When you disclose too much, yeah. it's impossible to get it back. You, you can't throw the fishy glide and try to reel it back in. So I think caution should be the rule of thumb. Yeah. And I can slowly, incrementally re reveal more if necessary. But if I go too far, too fast, it's not coming back. So we had this. That's right. That's right. Um, especially this is for young pastors, you know, and, and this isn't across the board. I'm not making a sweeping generalization when I say this, but when you show up to your first church or your first call or your first internship, be careful the first person that greets you. <laughs> um, <laughs> th there, there, are, there are many who want to tailor and take a young pastor and form him according to what they want the ministry to be. Well, how many times when I first started, I had people in the handshake line telling me what I should be doing. <laughs> After a while that stopped because I wasn't doing it. Yeah. You know, like th that's, that's not the right place first no. off. Right. But there are those who, who are trying to shape the pastor according to their own image <laughs> or Take the or pastor just, for their own purposes, whatever. I mean, or just be cozy good, up to him because up. there's some sort of whatever yeah. they're trying to gain from that relationship. Yeah. That happens too. Uh -huh. Yeah. So these are all wisdom issues and things to wrestle through and think through. But I don't have anything else on this. Do you? Have <laughs> We've kind of exhausted leadership today. Yeah. <laughs> I think I need lunch. <laughs> Lead us out of here. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, Dan. We'll uh, we'll come back next time and discuss something more controversial. Next title. So, thanks.